A very warm welcome to St. Paul's Cathedral as we give thanks for the life and for the work of the Honourable Simon Finlay Crean. In particular, I'd like to welcome Simon's wife, Carol, their daughters, Emma and Sarah, and the wider Crean family. Welcome to Brigadier Robert Marsh, representing the Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia, Professor James Angus, the Lieutenant Governor of Victoria, the Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Anthony Antonisi, Albanese and Miss Jody Hayton, the Premier of Victoria, the Honourable Dan Andrews and Mrs Catherine Andrews, the Honourable Susan Lee, representing the Leader of the Opposition, Bishop Philip Huggins, representing the Archbishop of Melbourne, distinguished guests and all of you present here this morning as we come together to remember Simon, whose life has touched so many of our lives. Welcome also to all of you who are unable to join us here in person, but who are joining us via live stream in celebrating Simon's life and legacy. This beautiful cathedral stands on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation, land that was taken and not ceded. We give thanks for their ancestors and we acknowledge the ongoing right and responsibility of their elders to care for this country. We're committed to work and pray towards a more just settlement for first people and pay our respects to indigenous people and Torres Strait Islanders with us or engaging with our live stream. As we give thanks to God for Simon Crean, we ask that his life of service might inspire us to share God's gift of love with others. And we pray that the firm and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life Christ Jesus came to bring to all who believe might be a comfort to us as we mourn him. In the midst of life, we are in death. Of whom may we seek for help, but of thee, O Lord. We have come together to thank God for the life of Simon Crean, to mourn and honour him, to lay to rest his mortal body, and to support one another in our grief. Christians believe that those who die in Christ share eternal life with him. Therefore, in faith and hope, we turn to God, who created and sustains us all. We pray together. Loving God, you are the source of life. May your life-giving spirit flow through us and fill us with compassion one for another. In our sorrow, give us the calm of your peace. Kindle our hope and let our grief give way to joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
sound That's a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I pay my respect to any Indigenous people who are joining us here today. To Carol Crean and the members of the Crean family. To Brigadier Robert Marsh, representing the Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia. Professor James Angus, the Lieutenant, Lieutenant General of Victoria. To the Premier of Victoria, Dan Andrews, and to Kath Andrews. And to Susan Lay, representing the Leader of the Opposition. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We are here to mourn a great Australian who served his country and his community with humility and compassion, with integrity and intellect. A beloved son of the Australian Labor Party, whose personal qualities earned him a respect that knew no political boundaries. As one of its true servants, Simon embodied so much of what truly matters at the heart of the Labor movement. That spirit of working together and standing up for each other. And above all, the sense of fairness that was forever his guiding star. As a son of Frank Crean, who had regular encounters at home with the likes of Doc Evatt, Arthur Corwell and Gough Whitlam, Simon had the benefit of growing up, observing Labor history firsthand. He fulfilled so many roles, Secretary of the Stormont and Packers Union, President of the ACTU, Member for Hotham, Minister and Cabinet Minister in the Hawke, Keating, Rudd and Gillard governments, Deputy Leader and then Leader of the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party, 
chairman of the European Australian Business Council. What he never was, though, was a person who believed in positions of convenience. He never bought into politics as a game. His instinct was for reform, for change, for new ways of looking at problems, new approaches to solving them, to join the dots, as he was so fond of putting it. He often greeted the world with a crinkle-eyed geniality, an apt introduction to this man of decency, kindness and boundless generosity. And I think the photo uh, that is in the booklet at the front page today uh, captures uh, Simon like a photo I've never seen, just extraordinary. Politics may have its share of those who believe profoundly in their right to bear grudges, but Simon wasn't one of them. He could fight battles against someone yet still maintain the respect of the other. Even more uncommonly, he could keep the friendship. That's because what always guided Simon was principle. When he voiced his opposition to sending Australian troops to the Iraq war, he made it clear his argument was not with those who wore the uniform and served in Australia's name, but with the Howard government. He rose so powerfully to the occasion in making that argument. Each sentence he spoke in Parliament as fierce and as bright as a lightning strike. His stance would be vindicated by history, yet was deeply at odds with much of the political and media climate at the time. Simon's principles did not turn with the breeze. He reiterated his stance in the presence of President George W. Bush, reasoning rightly, to quote Simon, that friends must be honest with each other. President Bush was moved to describe it as a fine speech. But perhaps one of the most striking illustrations of Simon's character was the first of his Iraq speeches, when he went to speak with our troops face to face ahead of their deployment. Though he did not believe Australia should be part of that war, he made clear to our troops that the respect and gratitude he felt for them was deep and unwavering. Simon's ministerial career was quite extraordinary. In portfolios as diverse as employment, training, regional development, trade, primary industries, science, Simon gave his all, characterised by inclusive engagement and a determination to make a positive difference, not just to occupy the space. I do want to single out Simon's passion for the arts, which he understood was an essential part of the Labor mission. It was not a side project or a mere distraction or decoration. He knew a culturally confident nation has the strength to know itself and the imagination to enlarge itself. His final ministerial action was the launch of the cultural policy, Creative Nation. A decade later, Simon's work provided the five pillars on which my government's cultural policy, Revive, is based and we ensured that Simon was there at the SB launch earlier this year. Today, we express our respect and gratitude to Simon, a man who held the same values throughout his entire career, from his early union days to his trips to Europe in the name of Australia's economic interests. It's telling even if you just look at the words that bookend his distinguished parliamentary career in his maiden speech, Simon devoted himself to the national interest and to the creation of a more just and equitable society. Then turned to his final two speeches to Parliament, which happened to both be condolences. One for Hazel Hawke, in which Simon echoed Hazel's request to, to us all, quote, to think about what this country could be, inspiring Australians to approach their futures creatively and hopefully. And the other was for Mandawai Yunapingu. Simon urged, urging us to sort out the unfinished business of closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia. Simon served his country right until the end. 
It was bittersweet for me arriving in Berlin last week so soon after him. Had the circumstances been different, I know we would have compared notes. More importantly, I would have been the beneficiary of his wisdom, as I so often was. My hope now is that our sadness can give way to a sense of celebration of a life so very well lived. Carol and the family. Carol, the glow of the great love between you will never fade from your heart. We wrap you and all your family in our thoughts today. May our friend and comrade, Simon Crean, rest in peace. Well, welcome everybody and thank you for being here today on this very sad occasion and thank you Prime Minister for your kind remarks. I want to talk about Simon's upbringing, uh, what he was like as a person and Simon is my brother. Simon's life, uh, his eventual career as a unionist and politician was shaped early. Simon, myself and my brother Stephen were immersed in political life from day one. Our father, Frank, having left the Australian Taxation Office in the early 1940s to enter the Victorian State Parliament, coincided with the birth of Stephen in 1947, Simon in 1949, and me in 1950. Our mother told us that um, when Frank entered federal parliament, we used to travel to Canberra each year for the opening of parliament. She told us on the first occasion, uh, when Simon was two and I was six months and still in the pram, I was bitten on the toe by a two-year-old Kim Beasley. <laughs> Apparently I screamed, Simon started to cry, as did our brother Stephen and then Kim. Uh, apparently we all made up afterwards. As we all grew up, politics and life as kids of a federal member shaped our learning environment. Politics was discussed around the dinner table regularly and we all remembered, as the Prime Minister mentioned, having dinner with Doc Evatt, Arthur Corwell and Gough Whitlam on a number of occasions. Our mother never wanted any of the boys to enter politics. She thought it was too brutal. However, it was impossible to avoid whether from the ever-present political conversations or taking phone messages from our father's constituencies. Simon made it clear early on in his life that he wanted to be personally involved in the labour movement. He completed a law and economics degree at Monash University in 1970, didn't want to practise law and entered the union movement as a research officer with the Stormont and Packers Union. He met Bill Kelty in the early 1970s and together they forged a long time formidable working relationship and a very close personal relationship which was strong and enduring until Simon's death. Simon's professional approach was all about cooperation and outcomes. This underpinned his successes in the union movement through his parliamentary career and over the past 10 years post-parliament. Simon was a good listener and open to new ideas and approached issues with passion and diligence. He did not hold grudges, lived in the presence and always looked to the future, not backwards. All these qualities served him well in life and in his career. 
Bill and Carol and the Prime Minister has already mentioned some of his achievements. They will talk more on his achievements. But I want to talk about my brother, Simon. <coughs> and this is going to be hard for me emotionally. Our love for each other and our special bond and over 72 year history together with all our treasured memories was there in our recent trip together to Ireland and Scotland. We were tracing the family history, which we'd been meaning to do for some years. I was lucky to do that trip and I'll cher cherish it forever. We're on a tight budget in which we'd done many times before. We'd shared a twin room. As usual, there was a serious talk about politics and international affairs. We didn't always agree, I must add. He often spoke about Carol, Sarah and Emma and his recently born grandson, Coscree. It was obvious how much he adored and loved his family and he talked about celebrating Carol and Emma's birthdays, which he missed in May, and Sarah's birthday in June, all of which he got to do. There were the funny, somewhat frivolous occasions that regularly occurred in our lives together and we both loved all those occasions. Again, on the recent trip, Simon was navigating, I was driving, and as we're driving through the high and winding roads of the Scottish Highlands, he was continually observing his phone at the height above sea level, 400, 600, 800 feet. He said, Dave, we've reached the Battle of Hastings. I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, we're at 1066 feet above sea level. <laughs> I said, OK, tell me when we reach Magna Carta at 12.15. He said, Dave, I'll not only tell you that, I'll tell you when we reach Christopher Columbus, sailed the ocean blue in 1492. We did a high five at 1492, but then we lost interest because neither of us could remember any more notable dates off the top of our heads. <laughs> Near the end of the, our journey in Aberdeenshire, we had a whiskey tasting. I wasn't a whiskey drinker. They all tasted the same to me. Simon liked whiskey, whiskey but wasn't much better in discerning the nuances in the taste. Our whiskey guide was an expert and could discern the different flavours. On one occasion, he offered a special royal salute whisky and asked it to keep it in our mouths for 60 seconds and then tell him that the flavours that we experienced. At 10 seconds, all I felt was extreme burning. <laughs> and I was thinking, extreme burning on the palate, that's not a very sophisticated response. At 20 seconds, I looked at Simon, who was obviously experiencing a similar reaction, and we both started to laugh, which became uncontrollable, and at 40 seconds, we'd sprayed all the whiskey over the tasting table. <laughs> Simon, as a teenager, was a bit of a rebel, not much, but a bit of a rebel, dressed in those tapered trousers and pointy-toed shoes. We all liked the Beatles, as everyone did. Simon loved the Rolling Stones. Mum hated the Rolling Stones and wouldn't allow Simon to buy or play their records. So Simon, unbeknown to us, bought tickets to the Rolling Stones' first Australian concert in 1965 at the Palais Theatre in St Kilda and sneaked out of the house in the evening. And I don't think Mum ever found out. Simon, also as a teenager, along with our eldest brother, Stephen, were pranksters, usually at my expense. All three of us in the mid-60s had just watched the Alfred Hitchcock film Psycho on TV. Both my brothers knew I hated the dark and had those images of the horror movie in my head. They had removed the light globe in the lounge room grabbed me, threw me in the lounge in complete darkness and locked the door. I was never the same after that. <laughs> Simon had an incredible sense of curiosity and adventure. Uh, he did the Kokoda Trail. He did a cycling tour through Mongolia in a group that they called Once Were Warriors. I believe this sense uh, of curiosity and adventure developed in his early teens where he spent 
many days in bed with asthma and had developed a love of reading where he would plough through book after book. Lord of the Rings and Homer's Iliad were two that I recall. We had a special bond and this bond strengthened after the accidental death of our brother Stephen in 1985. The time was difficult for us both, for our mother and father, Stephen's wife Janice and their three young children, Miranda, Simon and Nick. Simon and I both observed with pride the three young children grow up, achieve and start families. They're all here today, along with my daughter Claudia, to farewell their loved Uncle Simon. <clears throat> Simon was a serious and engaging person. He was a funny person, and we both enjoyed each other's sense of humour. He was a devoted family man and a loving, caring brother. He died too soon from a large clot to the lungs, a pulmonary embolus. He was very unlucky not to have received warning signs or symptoms. It was a tragedy for us all and we're all devastated. I will miss him terribly. Uh, for Simon. Uh, I first, first met Simon Crean in December 1970. Came to work for the Storm and Packers Union, the union that I'd been working for for not long. He was going to work at the Trades Hall Council of the Victorian branch. I was at the ACTU office working for the Storm and Packers Union. He was 21, I was 22. And by chance, we had come to a union that neither of us ever expected to be at. But we found a place for us, which was union heaven. With the leader of the union, Bill Landier, a genius, a flawed genius, but nevertheless a genius, who just wanted two things in life. He wanted the union to be strong, to improve the wages and working conditions of what were significantly low paid people. And secondly, he desperately wanted the Labor Party to win. The union wanted the Labor Party to win. The workers were on 75 cents an hour to a dollar and four cents an hour. They could be sacked, get a week's notice. None of them had health cover, none of them had superannuation. When the women got pregnant, they got the sack. It was a period of hope for the union. And as for the Labor Party, it had not won in Victoria for 15 years, and had not won federally for 21 years. And every poll at the time showed the victory was not in sight. Voters between the ages 21 to 28 were voting two to one against the Labor Party. So there's no great hope held out. No great hope. Now, verbal finery and purity of political ideology was not what the union was about. It was about trying to get success and trying to get results. That's what it was about to try to make life better for people, make life better for working people in two ways, two fundamental beliefs. It wasn't a question of going to workers and say, here's three volumes of Das Capital, read it on the weekend. See what you can acquire and see whether you can use it to political advantage. And if that's too long, well, here is Karl Marx and Engels 
Communist Manifesto. Smaller, easier to read, but it might help you as well. Nor we believe in the great leap forward or in some magical market, some magic free hand that in some kind way would make the world better for working people. No, we just believed in two things, just two things, the power of a union, the power of a union. We never could sing those songs, Simon and I, but to be honest, we're never any good at it. Not like Bobby was really good at it, but we weren't. <laughs> but we did believe it. We believed that there was power in working men and women to improve their own working life. And we believed in the Labor Party. We believed that the Labor Party could do good. The three things which define the union's industrial strategy, three major disputes in which Simon was involved. The first, when you went to working people and asked the better paid to continue on strike to get the lower paid a better pay. And they did, and they did. When you asked men to continue to go on strike for women to get equal pay, and they did. When you asked workers in the skin and hide store to stay on strike, not to just get superannuation, but to get it in the fund established by the union, and they did. They defined the industrial life of the union and they defined political life for us, for almost entire life together. Simon went to be Federal Secretary. I went to the ACTU. And from 1978, Simon was with the ACTU, first of executive member, then vice president, and then president. His very first speech, his very first contribution to the ACTU executive was to say to an ACTU executive which had just heard the Indigenous people make their claims for land rights and they laughed at them. The executive laughed at them. Simon McCrean's very first contribution was to say to the ACTU executive that that was not good enough that Indigenous people deserve to be supported. And Bob Hawke said, that is the best speech I've ever heard from anybody at an ACG executive, the very first contribution. We went on to work together to develop an accord. And people talk about the accord between the government and the ACTU. But that was never the principal accord. The principal accord was between the unions. Between the unions, it was an accord in the union movement to do six major things. To give young working people an opportunity to remain at school to complete year 12. When the whole of the country had only one in three completing you can understand what it meant for working people. They never had that chance. The second was to provide national superannuation for everybody, national health care for everybody, a wage system in which workers had the right to bargain and to try to have the highest institutional minimum wage rates that a country could afford. And to ensure that was ever left in the system you filled the bucket to provide the greatest advantage to the disadvantaged and the greatest opportunity for those which had been disadvantaged in life through sex or colour. And to reform the union movement and to restructure it on our terms. And that accord was between the left of the union movement, the communists like Laurie Carmichael, Pat Garrity and Tom MacDonald, and the right of the union movement that were not even in the Labor Party. John Maynes of the Clarks, and a wonderful, wonderful union leader, uh, Jim Ma, and later Joda Brun. And of course, our own group, which was a centre group, Charlie Fitzgibbon and Ray Geetzel, and Martin Ferguson and Greg Sword, and Anna Booth, all the centre. That was the accord. There's an accord between the union movement to do those things. 
And Charlie Fitzgibbon was the initial captain. And when he left in 1983, Simon was the captain of the team. To do those things and to do them for working people. And Simon was tough. And he was tactical. After the second major Medicare dispute, in which we were harangued by the employers, criticised by the doctors, and obviously murdered by the government of the day, we decided to do something the union movement had never done, and that's to cross the Rubicon and make the claim on the oil industry, make the claim on companies to pay for health care. We did so on the understanding that if the Labor Party won the next election, we would give it back. And it was a tough, hard dispute. Our form of industrial activity was more like guerrilla warfare, to be honest, than straight out confrontation. And the oil industry realised, and they were correct to realise it, that the way to advance their cause was to bring the whole lot to a head and close down the state. At two, 12 o'clock one day, we got told that's what they're going to do. At two o'clock, they made a statement that they're going to close down Victoria. At 2.45, introduced into the Victorian legislation was an emergency legislation bill which prevented the oil companies closing it down. At four o'clock, the oil companies agreed. Simon Crean had organised with Bill Landew that emergency legislation. I think the only time emergency legislation has ever been introduced into this country that that had aided unions. Tough and tactical. And never think for a moment that he was soft. Not soft for today. And from that moment on, once the employers realised that there was a choice for them and a choice for this country, they could either pay for health care themselves like the companies did in the United States or to support a national system that provided national health care for everybody. Well, I don't think I've ever heard an employer or an employer organisation ever walk away from national health care ever since. It was one of the most defining points in Australian industrial history and Simon Crean was an architect of it. Not soft, but tough. Really hard and really tactical. And that's what we did, work together. We harnessed the power of the unions by bringing together the greatest group of young, active people to work in the ACTU to get practical results. To get practical results. Now, Simon and I, only had one minor difference in our entire political life. I'm a Labor Party believer. I've been in the Labor Party since I was 16 years old. And I believe in the Labor Party. But Simon was part of the Labor Party. He didn't hand out tickets for two hours on election day. He handed out tickets all day. He did the balloting. And on the night of the election, he was involved in committees, involved in conferences, selected people to candidates. He was enmeshed in the Labor Party. He was part of the Labor Party. One day he asked me, he said, Bill, would you do me a favour? Could you join the admin committee of the Labor Party? Well, I don't know any of you. I know that there are uh, some of you who actually do understand what the admin committee of the Labor Party was really like. Well, you go along, and uh, it's a Friday night, which is a convenient time because it's just after you had an opportunity to have a couple of drinks at the John Curtain, and you, you would go along, and Bob Hogg would mumble through the finance report to say, here's, here's, the, here's a number of uh, pints of milk we ordered, the, here's the a, here's a water bill and electricity bill and the gas bill. I mean, it was riveting, it was truly riveting. <laughs> and. Uh, Bob Hogg, I love Bob Hogg. Bob Hogg, I think in history will prove to be the most important uh, union, uh, important Labor Party secretary in its history. 
but it, it was not exciting, I've got to tell you that. <laughs> and Bill Hartley would get up and he would have a resolution. He would, his resolution would be to support the revolutionary brothers of some country. <laughs> and uh, Gareth Evans would get up and he would support the not so revolutionary brothers and sisters <laughs> of the same country. And it was exciting, really. I used to sit next to Pat Cully, and I used to say to Pat, where is this country, Pat? <laughs> and he would draw me a little map of Africa, and he'd say, there it is, Bill, how great, great. So the only time Simon and I really had any public differences ever was at the end of one of these nights, I said uh, to Bob, oh, what do we do with this resolution now? He said, what do you mean? I said, what do we do with it? He said, we sent it to state conference. I said, yes, yes. But what do we do after that? I said, do we write them a note to the revolutionary brothers and sisters and say that they should be pleased to know? By a narrow majority, by a narrow majority, but nevertheless, a narrow majority, uh, the admin committee of the Victorian Labor Party has passed a resolution to support them. And Simon said, stop that. Bill's just being facetious. <laughs> That's just fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Simon asked me to stand in for him one day to select the organiser for the Labor Party. So I did that. I thought I asked the candidate a really hard question. I said, what are your broad political beliefs? He said, I'm an anarchist. <laughs> well, it wasn't the answer that I expected, to be honest. For, uh, for a person who was aspiring to be an organiser of a political party in Australia, but nevertheless. And I didn't ask him any more questions. <laughs> so, but as it eventuated, he, uh, he um, didn't like motor cars, he loved public transport, and he was true to the union tradition of eight hour day, and the weekend was uh, a matter of a sanctuary. Simon rang me up from Geneva, he said, how did it go? Oh, I said, I don't think it went that well, Simon. <laughs> to be honest, I don't think it went that well. Anyway, he got back and next time we saw the candidate, Simon had talked to hundreds of people and chatted and a candidate came in and he said, uh, I was an anarchist in the Marxist uh, socialist philosophy that when the state withers away, and I'm an anarchist, and he would have a driving license and a driving test, and he would work on the weekends as required. Well, he didn't win, but he was a lot better. In fact, the socialist left candidate won. He won on the philosophy that we needed to have a wine club for Labor Party members. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, we're making a lot of progress, to be honest. You know, we actually got a real show of winning the elections now. And, uh, it was good fun with Simon. I didn't want to be on the admin committee, so I went especially to the state conference, and I did the best. I organised really well. People come up and say, I'm not standing. I don't want any votes. I wouldn't vote for myself. And I did very well. I was going home, and Pat Kelly, who I love Pat, he came up to me and he said, Panty, he's always panting. Pat, he says, oh, I got those extra five votes for you that Simon wanted. I said, what for? He said, to get you on the admin committee. <laughs> well, I said, I didn't want to be on the admin committee. He said, but we got you there. <laughs> well, what could you say? No, really, what can you say? Uh, but I did get even. I got even. Uh, a couple of months later, I said to Simon, one day, it's the start of an ACT executive. I said, uh, I thought you'd be a bit grumpy, Simon. He said, why would I be grumpy? I said, Essendon's just recruited Wayne Schimmelbush. He said, Wayne Schimmelbush? No, no. And he was grumpy. In fact, he was grumpy all day. He was grumpy, grumpy the next day when we found out it wasn't true. <laughs> uh, in fact, he was grumpy third years later when Ian Collins and I were with him in Dublin and uh, he said the same story. And Ian Collins said, yes, that's right. Uh, 
explained to him, well, was a Brunswick boy, and so is Keith Gregg. He said, they really should have been playing for Carlton. Simon said, you must know where North Melbourne is. It's not in the bloody west of uh, Western Australia, it's in the north of Melbourne. They're Brunswick boys, they should be playing for us. And he was number one supporter, and he was patron. And uh, he never ever, ever forgave me, I don't think, for, for that. He never forgave me. But I did it even on the other way. By chance, by chance we were at um, a football game at Arden Street. And it was, the day Essendon was only two points behind at three quarter time. Two points behind. And uh, Essendon were kicking with a five goal win in the last quarter and the Kangaroos were down to 17 men. They only had 17 men, and we were kicking with a five-goal win. And Ross Glenn Denning played at um, centre-half back and centre-half forward all day. He was magnificent. But we lost. We lost by a few goals. A very memorable game, and Simon always kept on telling me about that game. But I did say to Simon, to get back in his good spot, once I said in one of the impassioned speeches, that if you had a price that income to court, there would always be a centralised wage system. You can never have a price and income to court without a centralised wage system, never. And a journalist asked Simon, he said, uh, Mr Kelty said a few years ago that you can't have a price and income to court without a centralised wage system. He said they never have one. And Simon said, yes, he did. I agree with him completely. That was never then, but not never now. Not never now. And I said to Simon, you're just like Ross Glendening, mate. You're great at centre back and you're great at centre forward. You're just wonderful. And uh, I didn't want Simon to leave, to be honest. I didn't want, he was captain of the team. I didn't want him to leave. But uh, what can you say? Politics, he loved politics and he loved the party and he wanted to win. Wanted the party to be part of a winning party, do some great things in Parliament. And it wasn't easy, because Simon was a star at the ILO. It wasn't just an ordinary unionist, but he was a star at the ILO. John Monk said that if he had wished to, he could have been the head of the ILO. And he said, John Monk said, I put that to Simon once. He said, no, we're saving that position for Bob, which we were. That was the game plan. When Bob left Parliament, he would go to be the head of the ILO. And we were Bob's great supporters and believers, and we loved him. Simon did go to Parliament because he believed in it. The Prime Minister has already referred to some of those things, and I'm not going to dwell on them. But I will say this, just three things about those things. The Working Nation Statement is the most significant statement on employment other than the 1945 white paper on employment in the history of this country. Because it wasn't just about getting people jobs. It was about transitioning and transforming the Australian economy in jobs. It was very, very significant. And, and Simon was a party to it, implemented it. And secondly, he, he did love the arts. He loved the arts. I remember a meeting somewhere, I think it was at Namurka or something, and somebody got up and gave Simon a very hard time about uh, his commitment to arts and to sport as real industries, employing real people, real people with real jobs. And Simon said, I don't know. He said, he said I'd just like to quote Dr. Coombs, one of the great Australians in our history. He said, Coombs said that you can save money in an orchestra by getting rid of four oboe players, three violinists, and you can make the, cut the baton in half. You save money. But if nobody listens, there's no productivity. Creativity creates its own demand, and demand creates its own productivity. These are real jobs, real people, and real industry. I well, said that was a masterly thing to say. Masterly and beautifully said, and absolutely right. The third was about regions. Simon, Lindsay and I, later Dave Robson, Dave McCoy, we went to hundreds of places in the promotion of regional policy. 
Margaret Thatcher's view was that the community did not mean politics. Simon's view was the absolute opposite. Community means politics. I remember we went to this place one day and Simon was talking to a woman farmer and he said to the woman farmer, how's your cat? And she said, very well, Simon, thank you very much. I said to Simon, I don't know, but what would you ask about a cat? She said, last year I was here and she said, her dog had died and a cat was sick. <laughs> so of course I asked about a cat. It's a very natural, warm thing to do. Simon was a community person. He was a community person. Talked naturally and kindly to everybody. A master. Now, he had his political conflicts and he had his political arguments. And some of those setbacks were almost Shakespearean in nature, to be honest. Uh, childhood friends, your own union, own union family, and a person you helped put on the pedestal to be Prime Minister. But, as people have said, uh, and I can't pretend to have that quality, don't think I have that quality, uh, Simon moved on. The next battle, the next battle is always the most important battle. The next fight's always the most important fight. So move on. So move on, Bill, he would say. So sure, sure enough, we'll move on. We'll move on. Now I know these forums and any speeches about people, rhetorically you do say, because you believe in it, Simon the Great Australian, one of the icons of the labour movement, one of the labour heroes. And you say it not just because it sounds good, because it's right. It's right. And you can judge Simon in many ways, but ultimately you've got to judge him of what he did, what is measurable and quantifiable in people's lives. And what is measurable and quantifiable is this, is this. So the Stormont and Packers are no longer on 75 cents an hour, they're $23 an hour, they all got health care, they've all got superannuation, they've all, all got better retirement, better protection at work, and they still have a union. They still have a union that's one of the most professional in this country. And that's true. That's true. It's not for rhetoric, it's not for excitement. Now, the Labor Party have gone on for better times, to be honest, for much better times. The Labor Party has been in power 45% of the time since 1970. 45%. Not, we haven't got to the 50%, but that might come. We will have to wait and see. And in Victoria, since 1980, have been in power 75% of the time. So a party that had written down and written off in 1970s has done all right since. And in a sense, more importantly, Simon's DNA is in every one of those policies. When people have their retirement, it's written in that, and their wages system is written in that, and their health care is written in that, and the trades policy is written in that, education policy, it is written in that. And regionalism is written in that. There's organisations he supported, people he supported. They're all part of what has made this country, all part of what has made this country. And Simon contributed to it. He didn't contribute in a little way. He contributed substantially in it. Contributed substantially to making this country a much better place. And in particular, he contributed to giving greatest hope to people. The greatest hope to people. Simon was an adventurer, an inquirer. He was a believer. I don't know how many churches we went to, but we went to a lot. And Collins and I actually had to put a quota on the number of churches we could visit in a day. We tried to say three churches should be enough, Simon. Three's enough. No, we went to them a lot because Simon was a believer and a carer for people. Let me say, conclusion. The fulcrum of his life was his family. The fulcrum of his life was that. His life was about his family. He loved them unconditionally, 
and he cared for them unconditionally, and he was proud of them unconditionally. And that was his life. I was fortunate to be at Mary Crane's 100th birthday. Simon spoke, David spoke, I think other people spoke, young Simon spoke. And Mary Crane, tiny as she was then, tiny as she was then, got up and she made a speech and she said, she said, the Labor Party should always be caring. The Labor Party should always be compassionate. The Labor Party should always be courageous. The Labor Party should always provide hope. Hope to the people who need it. And I thought to myself, well, that is just such a beautiful thing. And she said it so beautifully. And she's proud of her family. And she's proud of them all. Because they all did those things. They were courageous and they provided hope and they fought hard for people who really need it. And that's why Simon is a great Australian. That is why Simon is one of the great icons of the labour movement. And that is why Simon will have made a contribution that when people forget us and forget him and forget everything that people ever did, there will still be things that Simon did that have changed and made their life better. I love Simon. Like, like I did, really. And I see him there, and I know this, I do know this, that, you know, I would say to him, rest in peace. I would say, rest in peace, Simon. But it just seems so incongruous that uh, I just don't know. Because what I really have in mind is that uh, they already know Simon's coming. The word's out, he's on his way, he's coming. And they'll be uh, polishing up their alarm clocks, getting out their runners, getting a bicycle. Simon will be here and you can rest assured he'll be armed with one of those Frommer's guides or Lonely Planet's guides and he'll have the 10 best things to do in heaven. <laughs> and Simon will get there and he'll say, I'm ready. And he'll want to do the whole lot in the very first day. You're a wonderful person, Simon. I'll miss you. I'll miss you. Thanks. We stand and we sing, I vow to thee, my country.
Dad played many roles in life. He was a son, a brother, a loyal and honest friend, a loving husband, a dedicated politician, and for me, most importantly, a father and a grandfather. Lately, I've been doing a lot of walking, listening to music, and replaying all of the beautiful memories I have with him. This has made me reflect on the vast appreciation of life that he gave me. From the day that I was born, he began introducing me to the arts, nature, different parts of the world, and different communities, all of which we continue to enjoy throughout our time together. We always utilised and enjoyed our time with one another, making the library of memories I have with him extensive and accessible to guide me through moments of doubt and sadness. A particular memory that stands out is a recurring one, taken from our many camping trips. On every trip, he would take us on bushwalks that were long and often very difficult. I would always reach a point of exhaustion and defeat, not only from their duration or difficulty, because, but because I was always trying to keep up with Dad, who was an extremely fast walker. At this point, I would stop and yell out, Dad, wait for me. He would turn around and say, I'm waiting, but he'd still be walking on the spot. I would then say, I can see your legs moving. And he would say, yeah, but I'm still waiting. Despite how exhausted I was and how much I wanted to stop and have a break, I'd always continue to walk to catch up to him. When I asked him to wait, I believed that he would have to stop entirely. However, he showed me a different way. Dad always led by example. In this instance, he encouraged me to catch up to him and continue to walk by simply moving his legs and waiting. I think I keep referring back to this memory because it symbolises our relationship. He was able to encourage me to think differently. His advice was honest, extremely thought out, but never threatening. He used this approach with everyone he engaged with, which is why the level of respect that so many people have for him is so high. Dad believed strongly in the importance of community, relationships and social connection. He entered relationships and engaged with people through an empathetic lens, enabling him to see the best in others and understand the intentions behind people's actions. Dad's level of empathy allowed little room for resentment, which made him forgive easily despite any betrayal. The loyalty, honesty and persistence he brought to a friendship gave those on the receiving end a strong sense of trust and respect that he believed everyone deserved. Dad gave me the gift of empathy and showed me the importance of friendship. This has enabled me to establish a solid network of friends and family around me who, especially during this time, have given me the love and support I've needed to carry me through this. I would say Dad's passion was people connecting with, understanding and helping others. This is what made him so good in every role he played in life. He may not have always had the patience for te technology, but he always had the patience for people. Dad made people feel special and heard. He could empower people by identifying their contribution to the world and encourage them to do more. I was lucky to have this every time I saw him and I was always excited to see him. Dad's other passion was travelling. He would thoroughly research anywhere he was visiting and utilise every minute of his trip to try and experience it all. He actually did this with every day of his life, not just on holidays. We got to share his passion on family holidays. They were sacred to us as we almost got him all to ourselves. As a little girl, I found it exhausting to keep up with his excitement. He would drag us to every church, museum, landmark and garden and then read every single plaque in each of these. As I grew older, I developed the same thirst for experiencing and understanding different places and cultures. It gives me context and encourages me to continue to reflect on my own life, allowing me to be open for changes that I cannot control. In some ways, it gives me peace knowing that Dad left us doing something that he truly loved. I, I, had, I had 40 of the most fulfilling and loving years with Dad. 
But what's hard for me to accept is that he only had 10 months with his grandson, Cosmo. I remember the day that I found out I was pregnant. I was terrified, happy but also terrified. <laughs> I came over to mum and dad's in tears because I was struggling to envision the massive change that was, I, I was about to have. Dad heard the news and he got this smile he gets when he's really excited about something, but he was trying to hide it because I was upset. He then said, it's okay, I can take the baby for walks every day. <laughs> this smile and comment were all I needed to channel my fear into excitement because I knew how much of an amazing grandfather he would be because he was such a great dad. <sighs> Seeing dad and Cosmo's face when they saw each other was pure joy. <sighs> Even... Even though their time together was brief, they shared a unique bond that will continue as there is so much of Dad in Cosmo already. I have always been extremely proud of Dad, both as a father and a public figure. He carried himself with dignity in everything that he did. He fought for what he believed was right, despite it may be considered not the right thing to do. He established and encouraged important social policy and changes without ever needing any personal recognition. He was a loving and loyal friend, husband, father and grandfather who will be sorely missed. I want to thank everyone who has paid tribute to Dad's achievements and shared stories that reflect his character. It's comforting to hear the positive impact that he had on others and his achievements in his work and advocacy are not acknowledged. Dad was my mentor in life, and what an honour it was to have such a good teacher. Well, I've got a bit of a hard act to follow with everyone, but um, as we've heard, there's so much that can be said about Simon, and lots of stories, and we've had some great ones today. Thank you to everyone that has paid tribute to Simon and shared those stories with the family and each other. I particularly mention his beloved North Melbourne who wore black armbands for their match against Adelaide and the Australian Ballet for their tribute before the Ballet Jewels. Si would have been very moved, his family were. I met Simon and his brother Dave at the local tennis club I was probably 15, he's 17. They were the sons of the local member and I was a shy girl from South Melbourne. They were immaculately dressed, his mother's Mary's requirements, but they were friendly and fun. During school and holidays and uni holidays, a group of us would spend all of our time at the club. Chatting and laughing together was how we first connected. Simon was involved at university he listened to rock music and enjoyed card nights. It wasn't until a couple of years later at a tennis camp that we started our girlfriend-boyfriend relationship. We were married five years later. Despite coming from his political family and the political life that David described, which was massive, it was the movement against the Vietnam War at uni that steered him away from his law career to a job with the Storman and Packers Union, the first trade union person to present companies and industry with graphs and figures. He loved the trade union movement and their people, and he used all of his intelligence, courage, persistence to fight for the workers' rights and conditions. He was present every day at a strike. He understood the sacrifice. We are different people, but we have always been on the same page. Our lived experience over 55 years has been entwined with adventure, curiosity, debate, exploring Australia and the world and beauty in all of its forms. He took me on this, his journey, which as you've just heard has been an extre extremely colourful journey, and I am honoured and unbelievably grateful. Life was never dull. Sai lived in the moment 
and he loved the moments spent with his family. As Sarah said, his greatest passion was people, and he had time for everyone that crossed his path. He would earnestly engage with them, ask about their family, work, listen to their stories, and if asked, would then share some of himself. Many a time, people would recognise him and thank him for what he had achieved or was doing. And even though he didn't need recognition or praise, he would be really chuffed. He was an extraordinary person, a natural leader. He could engage with people from all walks of life, understand their needs, and from an intellectual depth, develop a clear vision and purpose. And he pursued that with passion. He had incredible self-belief. He trusted his intellect, he trusted his judgment, his life choices. That gave him the strength to fight for what he believed in, the capacity to be wounded, but to be regroup and fight again, and the humbleness to forgive and let go. During one of his early big union battles, which I think Bill has described, he had, came, he had come home and I asked, did we win? No, he replied. As I was about to console him, he said, not today, but we will. Sure enough, it was a victory, but a victory for all stakeholders. This was how he defined success. He loved Australia. He made it his job to know Australia, talk to its people, visit its places, understand its potential. He pictured Australia in the context of the region and the world. This formed the foundation of his life work in Parliament and in his many ministerial portfolios. Each portfolio would represent the dot in a larger picture and their connections would enable good policy making in government and in business. He was committed to consultation, cooperation, joining the dots for better people outcomes, a better Australia. He loved the Labor movement, the Labor Party. When Sam became the Labor Party leader, he was so proud and grateful to be in the leadership role to pursue the party's agenda. He was confident and looking forward to the election battle. His strong stance on waiting for UN evidence for committing to war was controversial. He believed it was worth fighting for sound policies and procedures, was prepared to jeopardise his position for the greater good of Australia. As a minister in the eventual Labor government, he went on to instigate great initiatives, the regional partnerships programs and Australia's first cultural policy for almost 20 years, Creative Australia. And he fought hard to secure funding for it. He believed that culture defines us and that Australia is special because we are home to the oldest living culture on earth and have embraced the greatest diversity of cultures. Investing and nurturing the arts fostered creativity and innovation, vital for our people and our nation moving into the future. He loved his friends, colleagues and his constituents. If one of them was sick or in need, he would go out of his way to call, visit, and not just once. He gave them all his treasured gift of loyalty. After listening to many speeches, and some from great world leaders, I believe I am not too biased to say he delivered amazing, meaningful speeches, and we have mentioned them today. They were poignant, insightful, inspirational. In a translatable and relatable manner, he would describe the relevant situations in a clear, factual way, analyse the most important hurdles, and suggest considered ways forward. He was very impressive. He believed everyone deserved the best of him and hoped his words would inform and influence their ideas or actions. 
For me, his most moving speech was for his electorate staff and constituents at his farewell function in Hotham, where he talked about being proud to have known them and been able to serve them. Growing up in church and going to church, I was always perplexed by the word grace. And it was everywhere, songs, readings, scripture. That night, I understood grace. He loved sunrises and sunsets and would make sure he caught the magnificent ones. For one regional car trip he was planning, as usual, he would ask for my input multiple times. I am passionate about astrology and had just listened to a talk between a famous astronomer and a First Nations elder about their knowledge of the night sky and how they had for thousands of years interpreted the night sky in their culture. The astronomer purposely had come to Australia to visit a special dark sky location and was blown away. That's where I want to go, I said. So our whole trip was then based on going to Lake Tyrrell Sea Lake, a unique lake Salt Lake Basin, mostly visited by tourists at a certain time of year to get a mirror-like reflection of themselves. We were going for the stars. We get to Sea Lake, check into a B&B, go straight down to catch the sunset. A 20 minute drive to the lake area, about a 1.5 kilometre walk down a dirt track, then a 600 at least metre boardwalk across the lake to a viewing. Great sunset. Sai is up the next morning before light to repeat the trip to capture the sun rise. We did it all over again that day for a second sunset, then back for dinner. Sai sets the alarm for 3 a.m., is up and dressed. Are we going to see the night sky? I am sound asleep, it is freezing and pitch black. No moon. Is the sky clear, I asked, almost hoping no. Yes, just make up your mind or I'm going back to bed. All right, and off we go. By the way, only phones for torches. Lucky we had been so many times because we couldn't see a thing, not even the outline of a tree. But the sky was something else, filled with stars. The Milky Way, galaxies, shooting stars and seven planets a unique sighting. And to make it even more special, the night sky was reflected in the lake. It was breathtaking. And we were the only ones there. This story, especially size tenacity for experienced life, is about us. Together, together, we achieved and experienced amazing things. Of course, I fell over because we didn't have a torch. I blamed Simon as usual and felt lucky we didn't get chased by a bull or anything else. But I will never forget that night. I think the song, Climb Every Mountain, is a perfect soundtrack for Sai. Wherever he visited, he always wanted to see the city landscape from the highest vantage point, to get its perspective, its growth, its beauty. He relished the big picture, to see where the buildings, houses, pastures, trees, rivers fitted together. But he also walked the streets of everywhere and went to want to become familiar with all the surrounds and the people. This was Sai enjoying and experiencing life. It was the thread through all of his innovations and initiatives. He could do the visionary work because he knew who and what and why made up the picture. And he understood that their placement, their connections were integral to the vision. Join the dots was his mantra. Creative Australia achieved and funded. He retired, but only from parliament. He sought no roles, but when approached, he chose those that were a continuum of his ministerial work in trade, education, the regions, his electorate and the arts. Throughout his career, he strongly believed that free trade agreements were instrumental to Australia's growth and development. 
and as a minister, he played a significant role in several successful ones. He was in Berlin as chair of the European Business Council, working on the FTA with the European Union, using all his skills to help achieve a result for Australia. Sai loved life. He embraced life with endless energy and positivity. He was an outcomes person. If I questioned something I was worried about or that was not going well, his response would be, it will be okay. What do we need to do? Carol, there is always a solution. He made our family feel comforted, calm and safe. He was not perfect and he accepted that people weren't, but everyone had something and he would focus on the something. So I never outgrew his joy of taking the family to Disneyland. We went four times. Putting up the Christmas tree with the wonderful decorations he had collected, or wrapping up everything purchased in December to put under the tree. We will, miss, we will all miss his happy smile, his cheeky eyes, his sense of fun and playfulness. I will miss catching that endearing, heck, I think you're wonderful look, unexpectedly, but often thrown my way. He has left a huge hole in our lives, but also a huge legacy. And if he could be asked one last question, what would you wish for Australia now? He would say, the FTA is agreed and signed and that Australians support the voice as a positive step for all. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Sai, a martlet of love. Sai, born a little martlet early to rummage, growing into perpetual flight, high in a sky more blue. A man with the strength to dream, redeeming his soul to fly at constant quest for knowledge. Seeking truth, helping all he can through adventure, leadership and hard, hard work, one soul, a soul we all knew. The family man and the activist using his gifted vision at flight to help those find their inner strength, being to them accepting and acknowledged, melting hearts surrounding him with his love to you, a flight destined to land, pray peace be with your humble soul, be it replenished. Thank you for all that you are. Our love for you is true. Every time I hear a sweet bird singing I think of you and I, my love Think of you and I And when I hear the evening bells ringing I hang my head and cry, my love, hang my head and cry. I will love you, I will love you. When we are gone, I will love you, 
I will love you when we are gone. Jumps in my breast, and until I hear your footsteps coming, my heart can no no rest. My love, my heart can no no rest. I will love you. I will love you. Having enjoyed the tributes just now, hearing the stories of Simon's life, I direct your attention now to our screens as we have a visual tribute to Simon.
Song of Solomon. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of the birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly contemned.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the midst of life, we are in death. We heard at the beginning of this service. Life is a precious gift from God, and we live it with death at hand each day. Simon's sudden death in Berlin a few weeks ago while heading an Australian trade mission to the EU was a stark reminder of the truth at the heart of today's service, that our days are numbered and that each life comes to an end. And while for some this truth might have been depressing, for many it's an encouragement to place our trust in what lasts forever, the love of God, which transcends the finality of death, and in that knowledge to live every day to the fullest. Living life to the fullest certainly was the case for Simon Crean, a politician who served four Labour governments as minister and who rightly has been described as Australia's most successful trade minister and probably most influential arts minister. A man of principle who hated injustice, who genuinely cared for those whom he represented, a politician who worked for the betterment of others. And these are only some of the accolades with which his peers described him when the news broke that Simon had died so unexpectedly, very much in the midst of life. Simon was held in universal esteem across party lines. He was as highly regarded for his devotion to our nation, Australia, and his devotion to the ideals that led him to become a leader, as we have heard in the trade union movement and in the Australian Labour Party, as he was for his devotion to his family. His wife of over 50 years, Carol, their daughters Emma and Sarah, their grandson Cosmo. And today we give thanks that Simon lived his life to the fullest and to the best. Today we give thanks for his love and for his devotion, and we ask that God would comfort us with his love in our loss and in our grief. The reading that Anne read for us from the Song of Solomon is a love song that's attributed to the wisest ruler in the Hebrew Bible, King Solomon, who speaks and sings of the power of human and of divine love. Love is what remains when all other accolades are stripped away. Love is what lasts when life comes to an end. A life that's lived on the premises of love can be as strong as death. Love is freely given. It's a gift of God that's there to be shared with others. And as a free gift, it cannot be sold. Indeed, those who make love a commodity would be utterly despised the poet tells us. But in order for love to endure, we've got to make it our own. We need to place our love on the firmest of all foundations, to set it as a seal upon our hearts, the place of our emotions, to set it as a personal signet on our arm, the instrument of our human actions. And when our thinking and when our actions are aligned with God's love, our own love will withstand even the greatest of dangers. The love that we feel for one another may well sweep us off our feet, but even the greatest breakers, many waters, cannot quench love. When we set God's love like a seal on our hearts and act out of that love, neither fire or water, neither death or the grave, will withstand it. Simon's love for his family, his values, and our nation amply reveal the motivation of his heart and actions. He was as wholeheartedly devoted to his family as he was to his stellar career as a leader in our nation. 15 years as president of the TUC, 23 years as a parliamentarian representing the people of Hotham, seven times over a minister of the Commonwealth, and at the pinnacle of his service, a principled leader of the opposition during the Second Iraq War. Love cannot be quenched, drowned, or sold, our reading knows. Love needs to be received 
and given freely in order to endure. The saint for whom this cathedral is named, St. Paul, knows about the costliness of God's love. We love one another because God loved us first, and every act of human love enables God's love to be shown forth around us. When our motivations and when our actions are grounded in that love, we allow the love of God to pour forth into our world. St. Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth contains a powerful reflection on the enduring nature of love. Love never ends, Paul knows, because at the end of our own lives, it's gathered up and it's reunited with the love of God from whence all love flows. When our lives come to an end, the partial will come to an end, and all that is completed in love, Paul assures us. But until that time, we live with faith and we live with hope, not with certainty. Now we see as in a glass darkly, Paul describes it. But when we die, then we will see face to face. When we pass through death, the love of God that is reflected in the countless loving actions of each individual life will shine forth as one love, and all that may be lacking in us will be complete. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known, Paul assures us. Christians believe that during our lives, it's because of God's love that we are able to love one another. Christians hope that when we die, we will enter into the love of a loving Savior who has known and loved us from the beginning. Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. When at our own deaths, we enter the love of God, which has motivated our actions in this life, we will be made whole, we will be made complete. St. Paul assures us. That greatest of all gifts, that love, is given to us today as a comfort, as we mourn Simon, a greatly loved husband, father, granddad, friend, colleague, comrade, and leader of our nation. That love is given to us today as an encouragement for each one of us to seek after it in the days and the years given to one of us as we remember Simon. And when our own lives will come to an end, I believe that that love will be given to us again as an invitation to enter with Simon and with all who have gone before us in faith into the presence of him whose love is from everlasting and in whose love we are complete and have life forever, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom be glory forever. Thanks be to God for giving us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Thanks be to God for the gift of life. Heavenly Father, you have made us in your image and called us to reflect your truth and light. We thank you for Simon Crean. We give thanks for Simon's devotion to his family life and friends, his deep love of Carol, Sarah and Emma, Klaus and Cosmo his love of his parents and brothers and his extended family. We give thanks for his sense of humour, his sense of adventure and love of travel and discovery. 
We give thanks for Simon's outstanding contribution to and connection with the communities in which he served, be it the Labor Party, the union movement, industry, or other associations. We give thanks for his commitment to work, for his focus and energy, and his desire to see Australia governed for the commonwealth of all Australians, for his valuing his colleagues and all those he worked with for reform, his staff teams, public servants, and those who facilitated his work life, his drivers and building staff. We give thanks for his personal qualities, his strong character, his integrity, his desire to see improvement in other people's situations. We give thanks for the way he always made time to say hello to everyone. We give thanks for his sharp intellect and his deep compassion. Above all, we give you thanks for your gracious promise to all your servants, living and departed, that we shall be made one again in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy, giver of all comfort, look graciously, we pray, on those who mourn, especially Carol, Sarah, Emma, David and families. Casting all their cares on you, may they know the consolation of your love through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. And to conclude our prayers, I invite you to join with me in saying the Lord's Prayer, the prayer Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, friends, I invite you to stand with me as we sing together, Morning is Broken. Let us entrust our brother Simon to the mercy of God. Holy and loving Father, by your mighty power you gave us life, and in your love you have given us new life in Christ Jesus. We entrust Simon to your merciful keeping in the faith of Jesus Christ, who died and rose again to save us and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in glory forever. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you've given us a sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. In your keeping are all who have departed in Christ. We here commit the body of our dear brother Simon to be buried in the ground. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and rose again for us, 
and who shall change our mortal bodies that it may be like his glorious body. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen.